Uh, we're continuing in our series. Uh, I wasn't here last week because I was a little bit under the weather. Uh, so uh, we're, I'm here today. So that's good. Uh, we're looking at uh, continuing in our series in Philippians. And uh, so we're looking at part two, which is halfway through. You should be able to find it in just a moment. But in our series, we're looking at Philippians. The first part was... Uh, uh, read, please read the instructions. And we looked last week at the first three of the instructions that Paul gives to us. And the first one was to stand firm in the Lord. One of the things that we need to do is have a firm foundation and stand firm in our faith, firm in the word, firm in prayer. He also said, agree with each other. We need to be in agreement with each other uh, and get along with each other here. Now, it doesn't mean that we agree with everything that everyone says or everything that everyone does. Uh, unity doesn't mean conformity, but it means agreeing with one another in love and rejoicing in the Lord always as well. There's only two times to praise the Lord, when you feel like it and when you don't. So if everything else falls into somewhere in that category, there's, but let's take our Bibles and let's read our portion of Scripture we have again. We'll look at the four final ones. And a couple of them, please, I don't want to take it as a rebuke, but it kind of falls into the whole aspect in, uh, of this series that Paul's dealing with. And, um, but he says here, Therefore, brothers and sisters, uh, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. And then he says, I plead with Eudia and, and Sintesh uh, to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companions, help these women that they may uh, have contended at my side for the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your, great, your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation with prayers and petition and with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if there is, in, is excellence or praiseworthy in anything, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me uh, or seen me put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. So, Father, we ask you to help us to understand the words and the, the, the final instructions that Paul is giving to this church. And as we look at as well as it applies to us today, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Stand firm in the Lord, agree with each other, and rejoice in the Lord always. The first three. The next one is let your gentleness be evident, verse 5. And he brings it to the end of that verse as well. He says, the Lord is near. Understand this, that, that God is with you wherever you go. I mean, he is with you. No matter where you find yourself, God is there. His presence, his spirit is there. And this verse is not well known as much as the surrounding verses, but it's just as important. This has a command to do with our attitude towards others. So here's the question. What is your attitude towards others? The word gentle means gracious, humble, patient spirit that puts up with others' faults. Look to the person next to you and say, you've got faults. I think you guys were just a little too eager to do that. <laughs> but when we realize that we all have faults, there's no one perfect here. Let me ask this. Are you patient with others? Are you humble? Are you forgiving? Notice your gentleness is to be evident to all, and you should demonstrate the gentle spirit, not only at home and in the church, uh, to your family, to your friends, but to your neighbor, to your co-workers. Are you getting a load of this? Listen to this. To the waitress at the restaurant, the waiter, the person at the checkout center, the telemarketer on the phone that calls at dinner time. 
See, the problem with, we got several problems nowadays with our new modern telephone systems. Like, we don't have a home phone. Right? You remember the days in the home phone when someone bothered you and you wanted to show them how disgusted you were? You could slam. How do you slam? You can't. Now, you can throw it on the ground, but then you got to go and buy a new phone. And sometimes we're not as patient with people that frustrate us as we should. Some of us, some of you, have some rough edges that need smoothing off. We can be pretty abrasive. We can be pretty pushy. And Paul says, let your gentleness be evident to all. What's that mean? In other words, when people see you, they should see a gentle spirit. It's part of your testimony to them. And I'll be honest, over the past little while, I am having the Holy Spirit to help me be patient and gentle with things getting and moving the way they should, especially when we're talking to medical people. I can be a little pushy. And sometimes it takes dad to step in and say, no, you're going to do this. You're going to do the altar. We don't want to do an ultrasound. Yes, you are. You are going to do an ultrasound. And I can be quite persuasive when I want to be. I can be pushy when I want to be. But I also have to have the mindset that I am also still representing Jesus. Although there are times that you like and don't, you're going to look at me, but don't look at me that way because we've all been there. Although there are times where you like to crawl over the counter to that person and give them a piece of your mind. You cannot do that. <laughs> Number one, you might be arrested. Number two, it's not a good testimony. So Paul says, let your gentleness, you can be firm yet gentle. You can be forceful and say, no, this is the way it's got to be, yet still be gentle. People may ask you what church you attend. They may ask you what religion you are affiliated with. It means little to them that you attend church or call yourself religious if you act the same way as the world does, if not worse sometimes than the world. Ouch. See, the Bible calls us to be different than the world, but when, when people hear you being critical and negative, speaking negative about others, it actually turns them off of Christianity. It's not who you are. It's not who you were called to be. And, and please, please take this with tongue in cheek. And the excuse that we often use is, that's just who I am. I tell it as it is. I shoot from the hip. Whatever other excuses that we use do not matter. We are believers. Everything that we portray... Everything that we present ourselves, we may be the only Jesus that person sees. And they may judge whether or not they want to follow Christ by their understanding and revelation of how we act. See, there are some that just feel that the need to say something. Why? Why? Some of us just need to get our two cents worth it. I deal with this at home quite often with my children. How many have teenage children? How many know that, that if you want to hire someone that knows everything, hire a teenager, why do they still know everything? Because they got an opinion on everything. My kids will often sit there and say, well, Dad, you don't know anything. Yeah, I'm 56 years old and I got where I am today because I know nothing. Well, you... you you can't say you know more than I do. I, I look at them and say, there is something seriously wrong with me if I'm 56 years old and you're 17 years old and I don't know more than you do. Either you are a prodigy or I'm just downright stupid. Now I look at them and say, are you calling me stupid? No, sir. 
I didn't think so. I deal with that all the time with my kids and constantly reminding them is when they feel the need to give their opinion. And unfortunately, that happens in real life. That happens in church. Everyone has an opinion on how, how things should go. Everyone is more willing, more than willing to give their opinion. And sometimes we feel that we have the right to speak our opinion whether it hurts someone or not. See, I saw a thing on Facebook the other day that sat there and says, wisdom is knowing what to say. No, sorry, knowledge is knowing what to say. Wisdom is knowing whether or not to say it or not. Knowledge is knowing what to say. Wisdom is knowing whether or not to say it or not. But when we look at this, when we have this mindset and we, we feel that we can hurt others, I'm going to tell you exactly how it is, and you can either say amen or ouch. When we hurt others, when we do not let our gentleness be evident to all, what we are, are you ready for it? Hang on, do you see? Because you will be offended. Just like you know now. You are carnal. You are fleshly. And you don't so show the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and you will stand before God and give an account for all the negative words that you have spoken. Now, I'm just digging it deeper, aren't I? My advice to you, and God has been dealing with me on this as well. Deal with your carnal nature now or let God deal with you later. Your choice. And Paul adds this, a motivation to command. The Lord is near. One of the characteristics of, of a citizen of heaven is our eyes are, are watching for the Savior's return. Christ is coming, so we need to treat each other well. Time is too short to be caught up in so many petty little arguments that are useless and pointless that five years down the road, six months down the road, one month, next week will not make any difference. We get so caught up. So let your gentleness be evident to all. Number five, don't worry. Verse five, verse six and seven, pray. So we've had four instructions so far. Stand from the Lord, agree with each other, rejoice in the Lord always, and let your gentleness be evident to all. Now we come to the fifth instruction. Don't worry, pray. Why? He says in verse six, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Once again, this is a very familiar uh, and, and, and precious verse. And let's take a look at what he says. Do not be anxious about anything. Worry about nothing. This is a command without any exceptions. There are actually four words for prayer tucked away in that one sentence. Prayer, petition, thanksgiving, and request. The first word is just the general word for prayer. The words petition and request both have to do with asking God for help. Why is it so often when the last thing we want to do is to ask God for help? We figure we can get this thing figured out on our own, figure out on our own strength, and we say, well, you know, hear people say, well, have you prayed about it? Am I the only one that turns around and sometimes says, no, I haven't? The fourth word is tucked in the middle. There brings out another aspect of prayer, which is thanksgiving. We usually don't think about thanking God. We usually think about thanking God after he's answered our request. But notice what Philippians tells us in verse 6. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. And even so, as I am asking God, I am already thanking him, thanking him for being my God, thanking him for being my Savior, thanking him for hearing my prayer, and in faith, thanking him for answering my prayer according to his wisdom. Presents your request to God is, is more literally present your request before God in his presence. 
And so we come before God in his presence. We pray specifically. We pray in faith. We pray with thanksgiving. Don't worry, pray. The two commands go together. In fact, it is impossible to obey the first command without obeying the, without obeying the second command. The only way you can worry about nothing is to pray about everything. Every time you are faced with something to worry about it. The Bible tells us to turn it over in prayer and to turn it to God. Let me ask this. Is there anyone in this room today that can lift their hand and say that God has let you down or disappointed you? He hasn't done it to me. He's never disappointed me. Now, a good friend of mine who has gone home to be with the Lord, Dale Switzer. Remember the Switzer singers years ago? Anybody remember them? Some of you do. I'm dating myself really now. They were a southern gospel type of thing. His son, I think age three, was playing drums like, like a banshee. He was just fantastic. And they, they were a musical traveling group that went around all over Ontario, and they sang and played, and he preached. They pastored a church in, in London for a little while, but he died and went to the Lord. And one of the songs that he sang was, Rest Assured, God is Seldom Early, But Never Late. Sometimes we have a hard time because we believe that God should answer our prayer on our time schedule. Well, God, you have until 3 p.m. today to do this. Well, God, you have until this time, and you, you have to answer this prayer this way. Well, God's like, no, I will answer your prayer my way, my time, my schedule, how I want to. But the thing is, do we trust him? Here's the, here's the million-dollar question. Do we trust him enough with our lives? Do we trust him enough with our family? Do we trust him enough with everything that we have to be able to sit there and say, God, I thank you in advance even though you may answer my prayer completely different than the way I think it should be answered, I trust you in advance to thank you in advance before I see the answer to my prayer. That's hard to do. That's hard to do. When everything seems to be coming against you, when all the odds are against you, when everything looks like there's no way out, to sit there and say, well, God, I thank you that you've answered this prayer. In the world's mindset, that's just ludicrous. That's like getting paid for a job that's not even done yet. Like anyone who's ever worked say, you know, when you go for a job, they hold back, what, a week to two weeks of pay. That's what they do. That's you don't get paid in advance for, you, for your work. And the mindset of the world that why would I thank God before he answers my prayer? Let's wait to see if God comes through first. And Paul says, okay, don't think that way. Think in faith. Believe in that he will. I have known this peace from the Lord many times. And Paul is right. It is beyond our understanding. It's beyond our understanding. I've watched God come through in, in many, many miraculous ways that, that you would look at the situation, you would look at the circumstances, it would seem totally impossible. Now, that songwriter said, rest assured God is seldom early. Sometimes he's early. Most of the time he's not. He's right on time. 
And Paul says the supernatural peace will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The word guarded is a military term. It is used of soldiers standing guard over a city to protect it from harm. And this is what God's peace that will stand guard over our heart and over our mind and protect us from the fear, from the worry, from the agonizing mindset the enemy will try to place in to our lives. Without a show of hands, how many of you last year or this particular year would have a hard time sleeping at night? Yeah. You know that's from the devil, right? How many of you, when you're faced with a situation, this, your mind runs away from you, and you think of the most worst scenario there possibly could be? That's the enemy bringing fear. I love what Paul tells Timothy when he says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and power and of a sound, sound mind. Fear and worry and, and being distraught is not from God. Does it mean we go around with a perpetual smile on our face? Well, some of us, it may not be that bad of an idea to try. But it does mean this, no matter what you face today, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, no matter what you face, if you are a believer, you can trust God that he will see you through. The sixth one is think good thoughts. These two instructions go hand in hand together. First, think good thoughts, important to practice. Look at verse 8. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on these things. I've got four letters for you. Write them down. G I. G O. G I G O. Now I'm going to give you the big, complicated definition of those four letters G I G O. Garbage in, garbage out. It's actually. Uh, I've been told it is a computer term that means if you put poor programming in, you will get poor results. Well, it's true for our minds as well. If you put garbage into your mind, you will get garbage out in your life. Some of the TV shows that are being aired and we allow this material in our living rooms and into our homes. Uh, I'm not telling you to go out and get your TVs and throw them in the garbage and say the pastor doesn't even believe in TV. I like TVs. There are certain shows I love watching. But unfortunately, sometimes we allow things into our lives, into our minds, into our homes, and we wonder why we're struggling in our walk with the Lord. We wonder why things can seem so difficult. For instance, now I do not watch soap operas. My mother did. And I hope you don't get offended by this, but the popular daytime soap, The Young and the Restless, first broadcasted on March 26, 1973. Young and the Restless. Originally broadcasted as a half-hour episode five days a week. The show expanded to its one-hour episode on February 4, 1980. And it is still on the air today. And that's 47 years in going strong. So there are so many other television shows, so many other movies and social media videos that I could mention. But I probably would make a lot of enemies if I did. I'm not here to tell you what you can and cannot watch. That's not my place. That's not the purpose of this point. But, and I cannot make a decision for you, but I will say this. What you feed your mind has such an important 
impact upon your life. What you see, whether it's on the computer, whether it's a Facebook meme. How many don't know what a meme is? Yeah, I'll explain to you later. Google it. Facebook meme, internet meme, and different little short videos. We watch these things, and some are good, some are not. But what we feed into our minds is, and we find ourselves become desensitized, where when someone drops the F-bomb, it doesn't bother. I, I heard one believer sit there and said, I watched this fantastic movie. He only dropped the F-bomb about a dozen times and said Jesus Christ about half a dozen times. And I'm thinking, and you don't see an issue with that. So what Paul says, he says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent, if anything is praiseworthy, so whatever is true means those things that are real, genuine, honest. Don't live in a fantasy world and don't listen to the lies of the world. Stay connected to those things that are true and honest and dependable. Whatever is noble means those things that are honorable, uh, dignified, solemn, majestic, worthy of respect. Don't think on thoughts, on unworthy thoughts. Don't leave your mind in the gutter. Think about noble things like sacrifice and honor. All for the days where young men and women would think about sacrifice and honor. Go outside and reflect on God's majestic creation. You may have to wait till the spring, but you can still do so. Whatever right means, all things that are upright, just, and proper. Here's a hint. If you're watching a lot of daytime television, you're probably not filling your mind with things that are right and proper. Just say. Whatever pure means, those things that are holy and chaste and undefiled. Whatever is lovely means those things that are pleasing, dear, agreeable, with that which calls forth love. Whatever is admirable means those things that are commendable or attractive. And then Paul sums up all these six sayings by saying, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on these things. So I don't know what you watch. I don't know what you think. I don't know what goes through your mind. I don't know what you allow into your mind. I don't know what you allow into your home. That's not for me to judge. But Paul says, if there's anything excellent or praiseworthy, think on these things. And I like what Isaiah 55 or 7 will be on the screen. It says, let the wicked forsake his ways and the evil man his thoughts. Let's face it. We are sinful people. We are. We are sinful people, and the only way to get rid of the bad stuff in our minds is to replace it with the good. Romans 12, 2, it said, talks about transforming, being, being transformed by the renewing of our mind. Memorizing scripture is key here as we learn to think on God's thoughts after him, spending time in God's word, listening to good Christian music in home or in the car. All of these things are important to, to, to filling our minds with good things, to filter out the bad, to focus on the good, and to practice discernment. If you're watching something or listening to something or reading something and you felt the need to change the channel, uh, close the book or uh, the lid on the laptop, if Jesus walked in the room, then maybe you should not be viewing it at all. If someone walks in the room and you're looking at something on your laptop, you immediately close your laptop. Or you scramble for the remote and say, got to get that channel off there. Or you got to close up the book and if Jesus came up to it and said, what you, what you reading? Nothing you'd be interested in, Lord. 
then maybe we should revisit what we are putting into our minds. The last one, and we'll be closing up with this, put into practice. The final instruction is says, don't just think it. See, for a long time, we as believers think we know the Bible. We know what the Bible says. We know the Bible says we, th- we should tithe, but we don't. We know the Bible says we should pray, but we don't. We know the Bible says we should be faithful in attending church, but other than sickness or whatever, but we don't. We know the Bible says that we should be kind to one another, but in all honesty, sometimes we're not. Can, can I say this as gently as I possibly can? Sometimes Christians can be the most meanest people there is. We, we, we can't, and I put myself in that same category. We, you see, the problem is not knowing, is not, not knowing what the Bible says, because we know what the Bible says. We know what, the, what we should do. Our problem is we don't do it. We don't tithe like we should because we're afraid that, you know, well, I need that money for this bill. I need that money for that bill. That, that you know, I can't give God 10% of my income. I'll, I'll give him five or I'll give him three. And God says, well, I'm asking you to walk in obedience. Well, I don't want to. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, I don't want to because I don't like him. Well, I don't care if you like him or not. You're to love him but, and love your neighbor. Well, I don't want to. I, I, I don't want to read the Bible because I'd rather be on my Facebook and posting and looking at memes and spending time. I don't have time to read my Bible. I don't have time. To, I know I should and I will grow more, but I don't want to. And we do that often. And my encouragement to you is as, not just as your pastor, but as a fellow brother in the Lord is that we can't just sit there. We have to put into practice. Don't just think it, do it. And Paul says in verse 9, he says, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And, the, and then he goes on and finishes the whole thing, this little section here. He says, and then the peace of God will be with you. If we put the practices of God, if we put what he tells us to do, and not just such a, well, you know, the Bible, it sounds good. It, it sounds like I, I know what I should do, but we actually put into practice what God tells us to do. His peace will be with us. And Paul asked the Philippians, did you learn something from me? Did you receive instructions? Have you heard what I've been saying? Have you seen my example? Then do it. I could just see Paul looking and say, what part don't you get? Just do it. It's like when you tell your children, go clean your room. Okay, I'll do that. Did you hear me? And three months later, yes, I heard you. Then how can we have it clean? It looked the same as it did the first time I asked you to. Go clean your room. Yes, I'll do that. You're still not doing it. How many parents would get frustrated at their kids for that? Don't just be a hearer. Be a doer of the word. And, and the same word applies to us today. We don't just come to church and listen and leave. We come so that our lives may be changed. Take what you've learned or received or heard, put into practice. I really feel that we need to get serious as, as believers in these last days about our calling to the holy. I preached. My, my, I, when I preach, I say, God, where are we? What will the end results be? The peace of God will be with us. That's it. For, nothing beats that. I would rather have the God of peace than the peace of God. Because when I have him, I have everything else. Fortunately, you don't have to choose between the two. They're actually related. Because only God's presence brings his peace. 
You want to know God's presence in your life? Then put these things into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Third, we have it. As we close off this, we are citizens of heaven, but we live here on this earth. So Paul leaves us with these instructions. Stand firm in the Lord. Agree with each other. Rejoice in the Lord always. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Do not worry. Pray. Think good thoughts. Put it into practice. These are the things that we cannot possibly do without Jesus Christ in our lives. And if we're not a Christian today, don't try to do this, this, and gain God's approval on your own because you will not. Rather, let this list show you your need of the Savior and put your faith in Christ who died for you. If you are a Christian don't try this list on your own strength. Ask Jesus for his help to help you to grow in these areas. And ask his forgiveness when you fail. We cannot do this list on our own, but we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have called us. You have separated us. And Father, as Paul tells us to, to let our gentleness be evident, to not worry but to pray, to seek your face. Father, we're so thankful for that, to think on good thoughts. Father, to change our thinking patterns as there's so many things out there that would try to pull it to the left and to the right. And Father, to put into practice what your word says to us today. I pray this in no other name but in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.